From deep inside the Death Star, I'm Andrew Richards. I'm Mark Krasinovich. And I'm Tomas Gagne. And welcome to Defrag Tools. Today we've got uh, the guys in to talk about a new system channels tool called Sysmon. And before we jump into that, Mark, this is your latest book, so you might as well explain what it is. It is. It's the third in my series of cyber, th cyber thrillers. First one being Zero a Day, second one Trojan Horse. This one, Rogue Code, came out in May. This one is about uh, hacking of the New York Stock Exchange. Actually, many real-life events in the last few months yeah. uh, kind of mirror what goes on in the book. Um, yeah, I've read it. It's gripping, without a doubt, the best of the three. Um, crazy amount of detail in it. Thanks. The, the research you did must have been quite extensive, quite frankly. Um, yeah, really good read. Can't put it down. Um, I took it all the way to Australia to make sure I could read it on the plane, and I enjoyed it immensely. Very cool, so yeah. uh, yeah, definitely, definitely a good read. Just go, just go buy it. Cool. So let's uh, talk about what Sysmon is. What, what, what is sure. it and how does it get created and all that stuff? What's the story? Well, so Sysmon is actually a tool that Thomas and I worked on for internal use at Microsoft to help us understand potential breaches of our own network and track intruders and what they were doing. And we developed uh, the first version of this tool early last year and released it on some of our internal networks, especially our very sensitive Server, servers hosting sensitive uh, information. Mm -hmm. And a couple months ago, or two or three months ago, we yep. decided, hey, we can make a variant of this that we could release publicly. There's some risks when you take a tool that's aimed at trying to track at ha attackers and yeah. release it publicly. One is that they can now look at the tool and see what it does. Yeah, and you're then, showing your hand kind yeah, of. Yeah, showing yeah. And, and work on evading it. So we didn't release everything that we've got in the internal version. The internal version does quite a bit more to help us track what it, uh, hackers are doing when mm -hmm. they get onto a system. But the public one takes the telemetry that is built into Windows uh, a big step forward in terms of capturing information related to intrusions and, and uh, the kinds of activities that you want to be able to collect so that you can process it and figure out how somebody's moving through a network and mm. what kinds of tools they're using as they get through the network. Yeah. So and we saw as well a lot of people trying to uh, build similar tools. So we thought if we release it publicly, then people can use it and they don't have to recreate all those features again. Mm -hmm. yeah. So architecturally, how does it work? So it's actually one that we uh, built on the foundation of Procmon. So the Procmon already has the ability to track files and network access. And it tracks file activity and process activity using uh, mini filter driver for file system activity and kernel callout hooks for process activity mm -hmm. and uses ETW for network activity. Yep. So Sysmon really takes a bunch of those those mechanisms that we already had you know, or already had in process monitor and basically packages them together just to go after the information in, interesting for this kind of monitoring. So some of the things that this tool does does that uh, Procmon doesn't is collect SHA uh, hashes, MD5 or SHA1 or SHA256 hashes of the mm. executables, mm -hmm. re records the information to the event log versus recording it to an internal buffer that then gets displayed in a GUI or saved to a file. And it's intended for headless operation, so it's not interactive. But the internal guts of it is, are very much based on the uh, same architecture as Process Monitor. So any limitations on speed and anything like that? Any performance associated issues? Not that we've or? seen. We've actually, like we've said, deployed it on production servers, uh, critical production servers mm -hmm. internally, and it's been incredibly stable. I don't yeah. think we've ever had a, no, an incident think, at all. No, I don't as, think we had any problem. Yeah. And, and, and those environments, you, we could deploy Procmon in theory, but maybe there's so much information for Procmon, that's, that's what the tool is for. And so there you have, you have uh, some information, but you don't have enough that you will actually really slow down the machine. Mm -hmm. And you said it comes out in ETW buffers, so it comes out in the event log? Or yep, it comes out in the event log in the, the system event log on, on pre-Windows 7 systems and on into its own event log on Windows 7 and higher, or Windows Vista and higher. Yeah. Cool. So uh, where do you get it? So you get it, uh, just I've got the web page open here to Sys Internals website, and you can see the 1.0 release back here at the beginning of August. There it is. We'll click on it, and uh, the usage is very straightforward. Like I said, it's a intended for headless installation, so you, here's the command line syntax, which is basically just install it or configure it. When you install it, you specify what type of hash you want, and the default is SHA-1. Mm -hmm and you specify whether you want network events to be traced. And these are not all network events. Process Monitor captures all network events. This is just network connections. And UDP uh, c 
connections between a client and server uh, with aggregations across, uh, I think it's half an hour intervals that we've decided. Right? Yeah, it's like, I think it's 15 minutes or, or 15 20 minutes, minutes something, yeah, like this, yeah. something like that. So how do you choose which um, uh, hash you should be using? Is it something to do about where you're going to put the data next? It, or is it, it has to do with whatever, if a lot of companies have their own hash databases and security researchers have their own hash databases that might be MD5 hashes or SHA-256. So we, that's why we give people the choice, but it defaults to SHA-1, which is what we yeah. use pretty much internally here at Microsoft. Cool. So you, um, I'm assuming you have to be elevated to install it because it needs a device yep. driver. Once you install it, it runs in the background. Survives reboots? Yep. yep. Survive, in fact, I install it on all my systems. It's running here on this system. It's been running and yep. for several months, actually. And so you can query it while it's running and then obviously use the event log to uh, review something. Yep. So has it actually born fruit yet? Have you? Uh, we can't really talk about whether it's born fruit internally, <laughs> but uh, it has. I've had my first success with it just recently, troubleshooting my mom's system. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of chagrin to say that my mom <laughs> periodically gets infected with malware and she doesn't know where she gets it. She does have Java on her system because she plays some games that require Java, so I'm not um, pointing any fingers, but this happens. Actually, I've taken away admin rights from her to make it harder for her to get infected. But the interesting thing was uh, a few weeks ago, she notified, she contacted me, hey Mark. My, escalated. Yeah, she escalated <laughs> to me. Uh, tier one, you know, the critical incident report. And she showed me that her system had gotten uh, infected again. You can see a, here a history of infections. Uh, one from August, but this one you can see on September 14th that uh, Microsoft Security Essentials had discovered and cleaned or quarantined an infection. And I'd gone through her system several times before. You can see back on August 23rd, she'd mm -hmm. gotten infected, and I thought I'd cleaned the system at that point and removed everything. So I was, and then at that point, I'd taken away admin rights from her. And so I was baffled as to how she could get infected again. So um, after the August 23rd infection, I'd installed Sysmon on her machine, hoping that if it ever something happened again, I could use Sysmon to help track back to exactly where she was getting infected from. Yep. System was reinfected, so fortunately, like I said, I had Sysmon ready. And if you look at the screenshot here, the infection, or the cleaning happened at um, here at 7:21 a.m. on September 14th. So I used that to go into the Sysmon event log, which I've got right here. So this is her her event log, which I've got loaded. And this we're in uh, Pacific time zone; she's on Eastern time zone, so that's why. Instead of 7:21 a.m., it's 4:21 a.m. Mm -hmm. But this is the event from the Microsoft Security Essentials malware engine changing the timestamp on that file. And this is one of the event types that Sysmon tracks that Process Monitor doesn't, which is changing a timestamp. And this is what we see attackers often do when they drop their malware on the system, they'll change the timestamp on it to blend in with time, other timestamps. So instead of it being now, it blends back into, say, yeah. when Windows was released or something like That's that. That's right. Yep. yep. And so this can help you identify, because it's very rare that legitimate applications, maybe a restore process would do this, but uh, most it's pretty rare that a legitimate application yeah. would change, mess with timestamps like this. It's constrained to backup restore software. And That's right. That's it. Yeah. And apparently, Microsoft Security Essentials, when it's uh, quarantining software, wants to preserve the timestamp as well. And that's what is showing up here that correlates with that time. Now, of course, this is a scan, that it's a scheduled scan that it's doing in the system, and it's come across this. I wanted to see uh, what other kind of clues I could find uh, as to where this thing originated. And the file that it had quarantined is called dervinst-1.exe. So you know, I just decided to see, hey, is, was dervinst whatever active at any point on the system? And if so, maybe I can get a track down where it came from. So I did a search for just Dervinst. All right, so what I came across was this entry, which isn't actually for Dervinst 1, but Dervinst 2, which is suspiciously similar. And the interesting thing that I found about this is this command line right here, which has, uh, you can see, offers wizard here, which sounds suspiciously like adware. Yeah. So this uh, let, made me believe that I was onto something. You can see this complex command line with a slash update there. So the question was, what's launching dervinst2.exe, which apparently wasn't caught by the malware engine 
and TMO engine. And if I scroll down, this is another difference is that between process monitor and this is this shows you as much information as it can here right in this event to help you get some context. So instead mm -hmm. of saying parent process ID is this and then ha you having to go back through the event log to find the launch of that process, instead it dumps that information right here. So the process might have launched three days ago, but you've got that information. It's parent image, parent command line, parent process ID. And then there's a correlation ID because parent process IDs can get reused. Mm -hmm. So this uniquely identifies this instance of this process with that PID. And you can see that it was this Dervins 2 was launched by this thing, updater.exe, sitting in uh, users test app data local SWV updater. And that thing is launching this piece of malware. So at that point, I said, well, what is that piece of malware? And what's launching this updater? So I searched for the updater. And we can just jump to the screenshot right here. Searching again for updater.exe deeper into the log, further into the past, came across this fact that it was launched by this task eng instance with this GUID as the task ID. So that's the way it's referenced in the task scheduler. So this was a scheduled task that was launching this updater, which apparently had gone out to the network, and that's also captured in the Sysmon event log, pulling down this executable, dervinst2, and then passing it to updater.exe to go do its installation and then reinfect your machine, apparently with dervinst1 as well. So the assumption is that the updater is running as a privileged user from the task? That's right. So the big question for me is, I'd gone through a cleaning exercise on our system before and thought I'd cleaned everything out. And one of my steps in that cleaning process is running auto runs and then seeing, cleaning out all the suspicious tasks. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't come across this. So my question was, is this, is this task new? Did I somehow miss it? And by the way, I also submitted this thing to, uh, to VirusTotal using SigCheck. And you can see that it's, cap it's identified by a bunch of anti-malware engines as malware. So this thing, this updater.exe, is definitely malicious. Microsoft uh, doesn't have a signature, didn't have a signature for it at the time that uh, I ran into this. But I turned back to auto runs. I launched, launched auto runs again and looked again at the scheduled tasks. And looking more closely, I said, hmm, you know, this updater.exe is right there. Why didn't I flag it before? Well, it's actually signed with a valid digital signature. You can see this amonetized limited. It's got this very generic description, software version updater. And you know, there's third party software. You can see there's uh, HP software on there. She liked, she's doing something with real player. And so this thing blended in to the background because it's got a valid digital signature. Mm. If it hadn't had one, then for sure I would have said this thing is suspicious and I would have investigated it. But it, because it had a, a valid one, I overlooked it. It's a very good example of hiding in plain sight. That's right. It looks too normal to, yeah. to, uh, to you know, bring attention to it. So. Yeah. And it's mm. just another uh, lesson. We've been talking about this a long time, yeah. that having a valid digital signature is no proof that the thing isn't not malicious. All, it's very easy for a malware author to go get a digital valid digital certificate, basically a, a couple hundred dollars, hundred fifty dollars, and and a valid phone number and a, a doing business as certificate you get from your local town hall, and that's enough to go get a VeriSign certificate yep. for code signing. So a very low bar to get one of these things. And this one actually looks like a pretty reasonably si reasonable size operation. This uh, basically it's essentially a botnet, infects people's machines, and then these malware, uh, these people that want to distribute malware or, or adware or hijack search engines, they come to these guys, mm. purchase you know, a certain number of machine infections, and then this thing is sitting there with an audit task going out to their command and control servers and pulling these things down periodically, mm -hmm. which is why she only was getting infected every now and then, not yeah. constantly infected, because they want to keep a low profile at the same time and not, So it's, it's, it's bot herding, isn't it? Like yeah, it's bot herding. That's, that's the phrase that's for right. it. That's right. Where they herd out, they, they I don't know, share out, not share out, they, they uh, lease out their... They, yeah, they lease, their, out, their they lease out these infected machines, yeah. And that's a, what had happened here. So I, I disabled it, and now... You know, her machine was clean from this thing. I submitted the files to the, our anti-malware people who said they've been analyzing this stuff, this particular variant, and there's a whole bunch of variants of it for a while now, and trying to shut down this network, but still still ongoing, even it's a big right battle. now as we speak. Yeah, big battle. Mm -hmm. But 
without Sysmon to lead me back into what happened, I wouldn't have connected the dots here. It, so it led me right to this piece of malware mm. and helped me clean the machine. So the, the, um, uh, the MFC would bring up event log had a lot of entries in it. So how many megabytes are in that log? Uh, we can capture up to 64 megabytes. Um, and then it's way more than the usual default, which is pretty small. Yeah, I think the default's only one megabyte for normally. Yep. So that should give you a fair few days worth, maybe not even months, and maybe yep. more That's than correct. that. Yeah, actually, on this one, when I time, I captured 914 and 93. So a couple weeks. A couple weeks. That's yeah. plenty. Yeah. Awesome. Actually, 93 might have been the date that I even installed it. I don't know. Actually, if we go back here and look at the first event. I think it was because. Um, it was it was eight something eight twenty three for the first one. Yeah, and if we if we take a look, there's these uh, event threes, which are network accesses, and if you there's a whole bunch of information on the network access. It resolves IP addresses as well. In the network access, so it shows you the source source IP address, whether it's IPv6. In this case, it is. So this is uh, SSDP, which is universal plug and play. Mm. And, uh, and it works behind multiple firewalls and all that stuff yep. quite happily. And also Mark showed the process grid and the way we built it is that it's unique across a whole domain. And so you can call it that grid and that grid will be a single instance of a process but across a whole domain. So it makes it easier if you have a lot of logs in your mm. company to actually be able to search for that unique process. Very cool. Awesome. Well. Thanks, guys, for popping in and yep, showing us this one. And we've got more features coming into the public version that we're going to release as well. So stay yep. tuned for some of that. Awesome. I suppose you'll talk about it at a future date. Yeah. Future date. Yeah. And yeah. when you're um, anti malware talks and stuff like that. That's right. Awesome. Well, thanks, guys. As always, leave your comments in the show notes below or email us at defragtools at microsoft.com. And have a good week. Mm -hmm.